Dragi prieteni, bună ziua, bună dimineața, bună seara, depinde când ascultați și urmăriți acest podcast. Eu sunt Alex Curdila, suntem în studioul la Gora și suntem la episodul 50 a podcastului Prepare for Future. Am alături de mine un om fenomenal, um, o persoană care a venit din America să ne ajute pe noi în cadrul unui eveniment de lasare a Google în Moldova. Uh, Beth este uh, Head of Research and Development la Jigsaw, care este un proiect Google. O să intrăm în toate detaliile despre cu ce ei se ocupă și care este rolul ei și care este viziunea în materie de dezinformare și pre-banking pentru Moldova. De aceea am să trec de acum în limba engleză ca să continuăm podcastul de astăzi. Hi Beth, hey. really glad you're here. Hey Alex, I'm so glad to be here with you. Um, there's so many things we can talk about and your job is 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 hard especially nowadays right like it's not um it's not an easy nine to five let's put it that way yeah i feel like ai took everything i was doing and it made it 10 times harder exactly <laughs> but before we start let's tell everyone um uh, about what happened uh, at google's event and your role in it so that everyone understands why all of a sudden google's here and we're talking about disinformation Yeah, yesterday was a big day for Moldova and for Google. Um, we hosted a, an event alongside you and a number of our, our partners here in Moldova uh, that announced um, Google coming to Moldova for the first time. We had our director of all of Central and Eastern Europe there with us, um, and we announced a $1 million dollar, uh, award for a number of projects, including some focused on cybersecurity, some focused on digital literacy and digital skills, um, as well as some countering disinformation. Um, and we had a very interesting panel where you spoke about uh, pre-banking campaigns. Yeah, I got to talk a little bit about some of the work my team and our, our colleagues in Central Europe have done uh, in Poland, Czechia, and Slovakia, and the opportunities to, to try that out in Moldova. So um, for people who don't know, which is, I'm guessing, everyone, right? Because it's, it's something new for Moldova. Uh, what are the technical solutions that Jigsaw is developing and deploying to identify and counteract misinformation in our region? So we have a number of things that we're, we're learning about, right? We're a research and development lab. So we try to say, what are the most promising things happening with academics and civil society that we can help scale to the digital moment uh, on social media, online? And so there's four of those, so we'll call them information interventions, that are really mature, that we've sort of done a lot of research on and, and deployed. Um, and these can work to both... Uh, uh, protect your brain from disinformation and also to to help people who are already maybe falling for it to come back uh, and, and think more critically. It's possible to come back? It's hard. It's much harder. Prevention is uh, is better than, than a cure, you know? It's... Um, Spoken it, just like a doctor. <laughs> yeah, truly. The medical metaphors are real. So the, these four different approaches that we've tested, one are called accuracy prompts. These are just like a little reminder to think about accuracy, sort of like switches on your critical thinking hat. Uh, another is called the redirect method, and this is for people who are starting down a rabbit hole. They see a little... You catch them. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's basically if you're searching for something, you can see a little ad that'll be like, hey, are you sure about that? And it'll redirect you to some other, oh, other points of view. Are they Google ads? Yeah, they're like Google ads. Like from Google. So Google used to run it, and now we've sort of, uh, we've got other people are running them. So in some places, governments run them, and in some places, NGOs run them. Um, they're often for, like, extremism. Uh, if people There should are, be like that uh, World War II poster, the guy that points at you, like, you are going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't Think know if that would it. work very well, but yeah, it's got it. It's often a little bit gentle, like, mm -hmm. hey, you seem like uh, you might be angry. Here's some other people who have been angry about this topic before, but here's what they had to say uh, when they learned a little bit more. Did you just assume my emotions? I did. <laughs> I, Google's reading your mind, yeah. and so they, no, it's, it's from the queries that people mm -hmm. are typing in. That's, that, I like the approach because it's gentle, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so um, someone... Usually people going down the rabbit hole are angry people or frustrated with something, you know, life's not going on and then something pops up on your in your screen and you're like, yeah, that's right. They're bad people doing this and doing that. Uh, so if you tell them in the same way, it might not register. Yeah, right? it might even backfire. Uh, one of the coolest parts of my job is my team and I get to interview people and we do these deep interviews. We go to their kitchens, we sit down with them on their sofas and... Sometimes we talk to former extremists, sometimes we talk to conspiracy theorists, and they tell us, you know, why and how they fell down the rabbit hole. And you're exactly right. There's always some emotional moment where, you know, they lost their job, they got divorced, they had something big happen, and then they started spending a ton of time online. And uh, 
something met their emotions and fed them uh, in a way that felt good. And so whether that was feeding their anger, feeding their sadness. Like confirmation bias, right? Totally, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, if we can meet someone's emotions where they are, if you're really angry about, you know, some, some loss you just had, can we, can we feed that anger but, but maybe redirect you towards sports or redirect you towards some other conversation about politics that's more, uh, more healthy and productive? Yeah, go yell at football players. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> There's healthy places to yell. Uh, that's pretty cool. I interrupted you. What are the other two? The other two, one is called authorship feedback. And this is like a little nudge. If you're having one of those angry moments and you're like posting something really nasty, maybe you're arguing with someone on a social media site, it just gives you a little pop up and it says, hey, it looks like this comment may violate our community's rules. Do you want to try retyping that? And actually, a bunch of people do re reformulate uh, their post, and so they're a little bit how less nasty on that. Better life. does it get? So I I don't know exactly how mm-hmm. much better, but about thirty to forty percent of people actually do rewrite their post, which is a pretty cool uh, uh, success rate for just like a little a little reminder. Um, and the last one is actually the one that I've spent about four and a half years now working on. It's like it's my baby. It's called pre-bunking. Mm-hmm. And pre-bunking comes from you know the 1960s. This is not something Google invented, but it's a, it's a really cool proactive strategy to help you build mental resistance, sort of like a mental armor against something trying to manipulate you. So you can think of it as like um, proactively building immunity to propaganda. We've been doing this with short videos, but other people do it with games. You can do it with text. Um, but, but Jigsaw has been refining and deploying these pre-bunking videos with a bunch of our, our partners, like academics and civil society groups, um, including here in the region in, in Central Europe. Hmm. Okay. Um, did you deploy in any countries yet? Here yeah. in, uh, in, in what languages are they also? So last year, when the start of the the war in Ukraine happened, we could anticipate that there would be a bunch of disinformation, especially about the Ukrainian refugees themselves. And we said, okay, this is an opportunity to pre-bunk some of that disinformation before it gets really bad. And so we went, uh, flew and, and spent some time in Poland, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia. And I was there talking to experts like fact checkers, like academics, like civil society, saying, okay, what do you anticipate based on history, based on your knowledge of the sort of online space, what do you anticipate is going to be a mainstream disinformation narrative about these Ukrainian refugees in a few months from now so that we can get ahead Mm -hmm. of it? And they told me two things. They said there's going to be these economic narratives that are sort of scapegoating, blaming these refugees for taking housing, taking jobs. And then there will be a second whole made-up narrative about them these uh, these migrants being dangerous, right? They'll mm-hmm. sort of be blamed as being criminals. Of course, or every whatever, single right? immigrant is like, I should go murder someone today. Exactly, <laughs> right, right, right. So you, we see these narratives over and over again. A lot of them we had the last time that there was a migrant crisis, you know, five six years mm-hmm. ago. Same things come back again. So we that's that's the real Achilles heel of disinformation is we can we can predict it. So, okay, so we, we, we hear about these two things that we can predict. So then I team up with a bunch of local creative agencies. We have a Polish one and a Czech one, and they create videos to uh, pre-bunk these, these narratives. And the videos are really cool. They're sort of like friends hanging out in a bar. They're one minute long, but in that one minute, you not only teach someone, hey, this is what the disinformation might look like, you then have um, people countering the disinformation. So you, as the viewer you're seeing, oh my gosh, this is what I might be exposed to in my social media feed. Oh, but here are the counter arguments. Now I'm equipped to know why that's false or why that, that's misleading me. And so just in one minute, we sort of give someone this full package of how to both spot and then reject the, the disinformation about Ukrainian refugees. It would have been, um, I'm just, you know, wishful thinking. It would have been great if last year you were also here because right as everything started you know we we literally got overwhelmed by refugees and we did it on our own accord basically because we opened all of our doors we opened our borders Uh, people were crossing without passports or with their animals or with their stuff um and i think we had like six hundred thousand people in the span of a few months months passed through moldova and we still have over hundred thousand here um, it was, I think it was, uh, not being modest at all, but it was unprecedented in world's history. No country ever opened the doors just for nothing and let people stay in their houses for free. Uh, we were driving like 
Ukrainians were scared because people were driving their cars to the border to pick them up. Wow. And if you are a refugee, you're like, uh, this doesn't look very, very okay, very safe. But they would take them in the car and ask, where do you need to go? Do you need a house? Do you need shelter of any kind or food or, or, or anything? So right as everything started on TikTok and on Facebook, we had a few videos of people um, complaining that, you know, I hosted Ukrainians and they messed up my house mm. or they stole something or, you know, and then all of these stereotypes that, you know, as neighbors, you have a lot of s stereotypes against each other and jokes. But then when there's um, something extreme happening, like the war, everyone's like, oh yeah, so Ukrainians do steal. Yeah, exactly. That's We should not let them in. Then we started a campaign, or in Moldova, I mean, called Moldova for Peace. My company was a part of it, where we, we thought how to counter this uh, disinformation that's been going on. I don't know how or why, if you ask me, we succeeded. But in the span of two weeks, those videos disappeared. Wow. And Ukrainians turned from a dirty, stealing uh, thieves and, and um, bandits into our uh, guests. Okay, I want to know what magic you, you pulled there. But, I mean, that story really resonates because there's always this little seed of truth, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe you were hosting Ukrainians and they spilled on your carpet or you yeah, know, something yeah. small. That's a seed of truth that then it gets spun into like something much, much bigger and these, it uses these stereotypes you mentioned yeah. and then suddenly it's a, it's, it's disinformation. Um, but, but how did you do it? How did you totally flip? The I'll narrative? tell you after the podcast, okay. but, uh, right. it was, um, we were just doing our job, right? We weren't really thinking, uh, like ahead. We we're just like, mm -hmm. okay, this is the problem and this is what we think would be the solution. And this is what the narrative should be to fix this. And it worked. Wow. So uh, I guess uh, you could say God works in mysterious ways because yeah. it helped. Well, that uh, sounds like a counter narrative. And that's a really yeah. useful approach too. that can come after the disinformation. I think what's cool about pre-bunking and what makes it really scalable where, where you can do it across multiple countries and multiple languages is you're just anticipating what the disinformation might be in the future. And you don't have to be super specific. You don't have to know exactly yeah. what the claim is going to be about this exact refugee doing this exact thing. But you know that, okay, there's this pattern of blaming them for vandalizing our homes. Let's pre-bunk that. Let's, let's get out ahead mm -hmm. of it. And that way, when they do come to our homes, you know, we're, we're prepared to, to welcome them with open arms. Uh, and what's really cool about uh, Google doing it is like we spoke before, it actually can feed you ads. The good, you know, let's just say the good kind of ads that prevent you from, from falling into it. Because yeah. we all, you know, we have this, um, and I guess it's a normal thing. You have this kind of stereotype about, you know, big companies like, oh, Google and Meta are just, all they do is take all our information and whatnot. But then in a situation like this, it was really useful. And I know you had something like this also happen, well, not Ukraine-related, but with the elections in Slovakia, right? Yeah, I'll talk about Slovakia in a mm -hmm. second, but you mentioned ads. It's worth saying, you know, the, the real innovation with this pre-bunking stuff, the, tech, the technique has been around, like I said, since the yeah. 1960s, but we were able to take the, the pre-bunking approach, package it into a short little video that you might see like any other ad, and then pay for ads on different social media platforms. So we actually put these videos on people's Facebooks, Instagrams, TikToks, what was then Twitter, RIP, yeah. and, uh, and YouTube. Good old times. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and so we, we didn't just stick to Google ads or, or Google platforms. We really put them across uh, where, wherever people were likely to run into disinformation across the internet. Because it's not, it, it's something that um, benefits the entire society, right? Exactly. It's and not something you put a medal on your chest for doing. Totally. I mean, we like to use this medical metaphor and compare it to a vaccine, right? Like it's, it, we don't know exactly when you might run into like the COVID virus, but we know that you should be defended against it uh, wherever you are. So it's a general vaccine. We're going to meet you on whatever platforms you, you use. So if, if we compare it to traditional fact checking, what is the actual like difference, pre, pre fact checking or debunking, because you said you try to prevent, obviously, but how does it differ from, from uh, how the other ones work? Yeah. Because so you said something at the event yesterday that I really liked. We are not on the offensive anymore. We have to be on the defensive. 
but pre-bunking is still offensive, right? Um, it is. It's still trying to mm-hmm. get, it's proactive for yeah, sure. Yeah. In some ways that feels like offense, but I, I think of it as kind of like playing defense, right? We're, we're preparing our brains and, and sort of building that mental armor for whenever, whenever the propaganda plays offense against us and, and attacks us. Um, I, I think when we, when we think about fact-checking and debunking, it's really a strategic strike. It is one claim that you're picking apart and you're trying to counter, and it's inherently reactive. It has to come after yep. the disinformation. The problem, when people are already affected by exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Misinformation is so sticky. Sometimes the stories are so entertaining or they're really like provocative and outrageous, so they, they stick in our minds a lot. Um, but if you're proactive and you get out ahead of them with a pre-bunk, uh, you don't have that, that same stickiness problem. Um, it's also much easier to scale. So, uh, you know, every single one of those claims, there might be a new misinformation claim, whether it's about refugees or, you know, the climate or whatever your topic is, there might be a new one that's generated every single day. I mean, with AI, new one generated every minute. Mm-hmm. Um, but with, uh, with pre-bunking, you don't look at the specific claims. You look at a, a bigger narrative or a bigger set of techniques that are like scapegoating. Or just kind work of on emotions, right? What emotion do, you, do we want? Uh, to counter by exactly. this pre-bunking campaign. Exactly. Can we tell you, hey, someone's going to try to make you afraid. They're going to try to manipulate your, your fear emotion. Don't When you start to feel that fear, know that you're being manipulated and don't trust it. And that is scalable, right? Because that can apply to tons of different claims any day you run into them, not just one specific claim. Um, I saw a video. It was a, an older interview from 2017 during my classes at the School of Journalism, uh, we had a DW journalist who presented a, a story that Channel 4, I think from Britain, did on AFD. For those who don't know, AFD is the far right, uh, or is it extremist now? Far right party in Germany that has a lot of seats now. But he went and he did an interview with the leader of the party. Mm. And he went like, it was punching. It was it was like a box match and he goes like so you know in all of these billboards that you put in the city and all the ads you claim uh which are she's like which are very racist by the way Mm -hmm. you claim that there's uh arab women wearing burqas everywhere and i have been in berlin for a week i have not seen any where are these scary Arabs that you're talking about? And the guy was like, oh, 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 you know, maybe they're busy right now. <laughs> <laughs> so he went to his throat and he just demolished the guy, which yeah. is not really something journalists should do. But I think everyone should watch that video and just like uh, as a pre-bunking campaign, you know, like you take... Uh, let's say Moldova's next elections and you go, so we are going to have someone say this and before you uh, assimilate that information, look around you because what 2020 or 2016 during the presidential election, there was a giant myth that president or candidate Maya Sandu will um, personally guarantee the immigration of 30,000 Syrian refugees. Wow. So everyone was scared, like, holy crap, uh, 30,000 Syrian refugees. We don't like refugees. We don't like, you know, people coming from there. And people were like, but it's not true. She never said anything like that. And it's still to this day something that's being mentioned. It's sticky, right? Very sticky. That's why I like the concept of pre-bunking. You can just slap the person before <laughs> before it gets into that that thing. Okay, sorry for the monologue. I do that a lot. No, that that makes a lot of sense. You know, and uh, you talked about Slovakia earlier, and I did mm-hmm. want to come back to it. You know, if the if the whole public already believes that uh, there are these these refugees coming or that refugees are dangerous, right? If that concept is already really popular, then pre-bunking might be too late. Right? It has to be pre. It has mm-hmm. to be before the uh, the disinformation has stuck in people's minds. And so we ran these videos that I mentioned uh, last year, about exactly a year ago, last fall. And we ran them in Poland, in the Czech Republic, and Slovakia. Super good results in, in Poland and the Czech Republic. We, we quizzed people, and they got better at both spotting and then countering or counter-arguing against uh, these claims of like scapegoating or fear-mongering about refugees. But in Slovakia, flat zeros, no really? results, totally didn't work. And we were like, whoa, how, it's like the same exact video. How did that happen? So we went and did follow-up interviews, and we did some focus groups with uh, a whole bunch of different folks in Slovakia. And we wanted to know, what do you think about these videos? Why don't they work? 
And what we learned was these narratives about uh, either refugees being dangerous or refugees taking economic resources, those were already very popular. People already believed uh, those narratives. Too yeah, late. We were too late. Mm -hmm. And so even the people who didn't believe disinformation generally, maybe they weren't as pro-Russia, they said, yeah, but refugees here kind of are violent sometimes. Mm -hmm. And here are all these actual news stories. And I said, okay, okay. So, so your campaign context, hit the wall. Our campaign mm -hmm. uh, was, was too late and picked kind of the wrong narratives to, to go after. So really good lesson for us that, uh, you know, this, this is not a silver bullet for sure. So can you uh, test something before you go in with the pre-banking campaign so for example for moldova now i'm we would already have to be working on pre-banking campaigns for the next elections right? because local elections are too late obviously but for next year but we do have a lot of beliefs already so how would you go about it would you collect what are these beliefs are first how what's the process how do you work with these organizations or media or parliament to yeah. to to develop it the first step is research. And so we come in and we talk to experts and we want to talk to fact checkers and think tanks and journalists and academics who study the sort of disinformation landscape. And we want to know what are the popular disinformation narratives today? What's already out there in the mainstream and what's on the fringes? What's ha happening in the little telegram chats or what's happening in sort like of... Like a random saying, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you know V-Contacta? Like what's yes. happening over there mm -hmm. that maybe will make it to Facebook in a few months? Uh, or, or whatever the dominant sort of mainstream uh, sites are. I don't mean to pick on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, and so that's we, we start with interviews, and then we'll usually do some sort of social media analysis where we actually collect a bunch of posts ourselves and try to see how the, the narratives are being talked about, what are the claims, where are they coming so from. So like social media listening tools and stuff? Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. And we also want to know who are they targeting. Are they mostly aimed at older folks? Are they aimed at Gen Z and the young people? Mm. Or are they just sort of trying to reach anyone who, who is a vulnerable target online? Um, and then we design our campaigns specifically towards those different audiences that are most vulnerable to, uh, to the disinformation. Is it automated, automated in any way? Great Do you use question. machine learning? Um, we're working on that right now. So there are already a bunch of tools out there to identify uh, disinformation narratives, but they're not very good yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of the reason is just disinformation narratives are evolving, especially the claims. Um, but the techniques, things like, you know, we talked about emotion, things like fear mongering or things like scapegoating, those are pretty constant over time. And we, are, we can train models. We've already got really good models for emotion. And now we're training models for things like scapegoating. And so we'll be releasing those publicly uh, in the next few months. Um, silly question. F for this, would uh, big companies, you know, such as Google and Meta, would, would you guys ever collaborate on this? Or, or did it already happen before? Is it something that, you know, uh, is already happening, or at least conversations that look... Because... Every election, after the election, it's like Zuckerberg did this or Google did this. And I'm guessing the guy is just sitting in his office like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. So we do swap notes. Mm -hmm. I think I would love to see more formal collaborations. That can be really hard just because, you know, these companies are competing with each other. But on, on fighting disinformation, we should be working together even more than we are. What, what we do now is, is we do exchange notes on what works and what doesn't. So I know, for example, that Twitter actually did, uh, they did pre-bunking before any of the other big platforms. Back in 2020, in the U.S. for our election, they ran these banner ads They're using oh, text yeah. at mm -hmm. the top. And they said, hey, you might see misleading information about mail-in ballots, right? There was a lot of disinformation because we were all home during COVID. We didn't know how to use the mail yeah. for voting. And they actually had, you know, a little warning about it. And then they gave, told you where to go for more information. That's a pre-bunk. Um, I think Facebook had something as well. And then Facebook did something recently with climate change, actually. Mm -hmm. They did a, a climate misinformation pre-bunk. So I think, you know, the different platforms are experimenting and we're, we're sort of exchanging notes as researchers, but there haven't been any more formal collaborations. What I like about Twitter is that on the tweets that are flagged as mis or disinformation, there's community note which immediate even on ads now so i i don't know why i'm not interested in it i only follow like science journalist stuff um every single time i open a tweet the first ad and it's always the first tweet underneath as a response was 
World War III is starting. <laughs> I saw it a few hundred times and it kind of stopped me from going down to see the actual replies that people put there. And then one time I'm like, what is this? Let me block it. I'm annoyed by it already. And I go to the bottom of the tweet and it actually says community note. Uh, there's no such you know, valid claim. No one ever said this. And, and then my question was, so why is the stupid ad running then? Why does Twitter allow it to to run? Because I know Google has specific policies to prevent it. You you know, there's trusted flaggers which we spoke about. Then I guess the ad ad gets taken down, right? right? So you can't do it anymore. But I do like that on on almost every tweet that I saw. This is bullshit. It was actually a community note stating that this is bullshit. That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the the X content moderation systems are a whole nother podcast. Mm -hmm. But I love the community notes thing. And I, I do think more platforms should do that, especially in an era where people are losing trust in institutions. Maybe not everyone trusts fact checkers, which is unfortunate, yeah. but true. I actually think community notes, when done right... Um, they not only can be quite accurate, but you can actually start to bridge people from different points of view. Like Reddit did. Exactly. Um, but the, the way that they've set this up, they use something called a bridging algorithm. And what that does is it finds people who are typically in disagreement. Maybe they're on the far right or the far left, uh, but they've both liked this one note. Oh. And then it only shows you those notes where there's sort of this overlap, this bridge between different groups of people. Uh, and so, so then you can go like, wait, this is not true. So you have both sides contribute to it. Yeah. It's really smart. Yeah, it's really cool. Mm. Um, and, and what it does is it, it finds the more, it, basically only the most accurate stuff rises up to that uh, middle of the bridge. I'm going to go on a limb here and say it would be great for YouTube to have the same thing. <clears throat> like you're watching, because there's so much stuff on YouTube, right? What is it? A hundred billion hours of content every second. Can you imagine if you could just flag the content and be like, this community note, this vlogger, whatever, is saying... Uh, Un, what is, what's the word unsubstantiated claims about what's going on it's not true you can watch it if you want it's just like another conspiracy video because you know people like conspiracy stuff but it's not true so i agree stay tuned yeah um youtube has a lot of cool things in the works uh to give people more context around the videos they see uh all right let's let's move uh forward towards um some some challenges and other learnings that you have like like Slovakia, maybe in different areas, what, what else did you learn from the pre-banking campaigns and the whole, you know, fighting disinformation? Yeah, one of the big challenges we have is that our memories are uh, imperfect, you know? Sometimes mm -hmm. you learn something in school and a week later before the test, you've already forgotten it. Uh, same thing happens with pre-bunking. Uh, we can pre-bunk you this week and maybe it lasts for a few weeks, but then the effects start to fade over time. So we wanted to know how long does it last? Uh, how long does your, you know, your vaccine keep your body safe from that virus? Uh, and just like a real vaccine, um, they, they sort of fade. But then we said, what about booster shots? Okay, so we learned that these short videos, you know, 30 seconds or, or one minute videos, they give you about two to four weeks. It's like little shorts. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah they give you two to four weeks of immunity in the ones that we developed. But then we made 15 second boosters and we found you could actually give people these little these little mental boosters that brought them right back up to full immunity to the, the misinformation and manipulation. D does it um, relate to the first video or is it something else entirely? Yeah, relates to the first video, sort of reminds you of the key points. It's like a little uh, a little study guide for yourself. OK, so if, if we were to do some pre-bunking campaigns in Moldova to get back to it, uh, how would an NGO approach you? How, what's the process for on their side? Well, do you send them the videos or do you send them the, the scripts? How does it work? So Jigsaw is really a little incubator and we've now tested and refined this approach. And now we're about to publish all of our resources out there for anyone else to create pre-bunking campaigns themselves. So if I was sitting in Moldova, I would want to take these these resources, sort of a template for how to create these videos um, and I'd want to team up with you know a creative agency that's good at making videos or maybe an influencer even you don't even have to spend mm -hmm. a lot of money doing this um, I'd want to partner with people who know a lot about the narratives that I'd want to, to get ahead of um, and then maybe someone who wants to pay for some of the ads to, to disseminate these really widely and so once you have that little cohort of, uh, of partners, you can actually start to develop the scripts. And we've got a step-by-step -step guide that teaches you this sort of three-part approach to a pre-bunking message. Um, and then you make your videos, and then you, uh, you buy ads, and you show them as ads to your, your target audience. W would they be able to send it to you for re review and feedback? 
I'm I'm more than happy to provide like, advice. Let, but no, I mean, yeah. like in, in general, it w- would is it, would that process work as well? They made this, and like we think something's missing. Can you take a look at it? But obviously, you don't speak the language. Would you hire someone that speaks or? give it to bard how, how would it work <laughs> yeah someday bard is going to do all of this for us I right, know, right? Uh, like hey bard go do this <laughs> for people who don't know bard is google's version of chat gpt it's a it's a ch- uh, large language model chatbot that uh, can do all sorts of cool things including fact check itself yes we're gonna get into it in okay, a bit because cool, cool. we spoke up with the students about it Yeah, but I I would say, you know, people can definitely come to me for advice, but there's also a number of researchers like like Mm. at universities that are the real, real experts in applying pre-bunking. So um, I'm sure there are some here in in Moldova, um, but also there are some wonderful folks at the University of Cambridge who I learned about all of this from. So shout out to Sandra Vanderlinden and John Rosenbeek um, and others there. They have developed not only these videos with us at Jigsaw, but a series of games. So just quick pause if anyone is looking for uh, a little more interactive version of this than just a you know a short video they have these online games where you are actually making the propaganda yourself you're in the you're in the shoes of the bad actor the bad guy um, and it's a it's a super cool way to learn about these manipulation techniques what they would use on you yeah so reverse psychology kind exactly of. Mm-hmm. and what's cool about the game is it actually uh the effects last longer so it lasts a couple months because uh, it's uh you're, you're building you remember memories yeah uh, well, actually at agora i know they are uh, working on a uh, monopoly style game uh i think it's called oligar or something where um the rules are basically the same as monopoly but Every single uh, square that you get into, you're an oligarch, right? Or, or a corrupt politician. So you have to uh, bribe your way into it. And then you pick a card um, that says something about, let's, let's just say, a state company. Yeah. So you buy that state company as an oligarch to run it for yourself. And then you pick the card and it tells you the story that actually happened. And it has a QR code on the back that you can scan, scan it, sends you to the news article. So there's oh, like a cool. uh, gay or car- free card out of jail thing also because, you know, you bribe the prosecutors and it's it's a really fun way of using the same um, concept where you learn to become an oligarch, uh, how to become one. And then when, when something happens, because, you see, journalists talk about problems all day long. If you listen to news, you get bored and annoyed in like a week. You're like, is everything that bad? So at some point, it kind of becomes, uh, you become numb to it, right? That's why uh, I love that you created a game because it diversifies the approach. So if journalists constantly find something bad in the country and they show it to you so you could demand improvement as a citizen, either through you know prote- protests or, or during voting uh, elections, if you're not involved in it all the way until then, then you're just like, man, these journalists, they really want to give us bad stuff on purpose. Mm. And then you get into conspiracy and then you see someone on TikTok saying some complete uh, uh, BS. And then you're like, yeah, it's true. Especially if they add, it's a fact. <clears throat> I've discovered that if someone says it's a fact, then it's Definitely a fact. <laughs> <laughs> and it works. I, my wife likes, comp- likes uh, conspiracy theories. Sometimes she shows me the craziest shit out there. Like, I go, what? And she's like, yeah, it's, uh, it could be true. I'm like, no. Does she, I was going to say, is this just purely entertainment or does she believe it's it? It's an entertainment, but sometimes she believes Ooh, it. That's how it starts, right? Yeah. You start, oh, it's just funny. It's just, just for just for laughs yeah, and yeah. then uh, it's not just for laughs anymore and then you catch yourself so I, I'm, I'm like sending her specific videos that would uh, confuse the algorithm <laughs> so she gets out of it but it's well, I like think I have an experiment right living next to me exactly you have to test all these pre-bunking videos on your wife and see if they work she's our target audience yeah that's why we always say during elections like go talk to your parents and grandparents and tell them what's going on because they consume information in a completely different way Mm -hmm. and they're much more tired than you are and they uh, would not actually want to go, it's generalizing of course, but they would not want to go dig deeper 
Oh, so this guy says that my son is going to bring 30,000 Syrians. That bitch. You know? <laughs> That's what an old person yeah, would say. It wouldn't sure, be like, sure. I don't think it's true. Let me go real quick on Media Critica and see what they are saying. It's, it's not going to happen. So I really like um, that we, we're talking about this and we're now know for sure what tools to use. Because you guys, you went, you went out and you did it. No one told you to do it, right? Yeah, no, no. You I just was, did it. Yeah, Jigsaw gets to choose what we work on, which is yeah. a real privilege. You mentioned elections. I just want to say, we talked about this a little bit yesterday mm-hmm. at the event um, with the deputy prime minister. And I, I made the point, you know, we have over 2 billion people around the world voting in democracies next year. That's a crazy number of elections. There's going to be so much disinformation. And elections are actually the most perfect situation to use pre-bunking because, because they repeat. We can anticipate by looking back at past elections what the new disinformation might be. Okay, in past Moldovan elections, what type of disinformation claims have you heard? Oh, you're asking me? I'm asking you. Uh, well, stuff like uh, the gays of Europe will invade us. Oh, wow. That's yes. get terrifying. Watch e- out. E- exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so if Or you... that Russia will invade. Like mm. all, Both sides is kind of playing to each other's hands sometimes. But okay, mostly so... it's just like, you know, we need Russia because we need gas. And you're like, well, yeah, I guess I don't like them, but I do want to be warm in winter. Yeah. Well, those are both perfect claims, right? Because they're both, you know, they're scapegoating different groups of people, but they're both using this recurring narrative of somebody's going to invade us if our, uh, after our election. Mm -hmm. And so you could make a pre-bunking video that says, hey, Moldovans, you're going to see some crazy BS this election cycle that says people are going to invade us. It's an old trope. Don't fall for it. Right, and you and can then actually you kind warn of people. tell them how. Yeah, don't fall for it. Yeah. Here's how to mm-hmm. not fall for it. Here's why someone says that. They're saying that to manipulate you. They're saying that to scare you. They're saying that to maybe keep you from voting. Whatever it is, mm-hmm. um, and and that really allows people the next time they run into that scrolling through their feed, they're like, oh, I've heard this before. That's not real. That's really cool. We should we should make that game here. We used to have many years ago. There was a Kishino mayor. Uh, I, I I don't think he made it. I think someone made fun of him, but actually worked in his favor. They made a game. So his name was Serafim. And they called the game Serafika Farafrika. Basically, <laughs> Serafim without fear. And you played a Super Mario style game being the mayor. And it was Whoa. so fun. That's cool. Yeah. So I, I think if, if you guys have or can share like the code and stuff with the students and whatnot they may be able to uh translate into english or russian for the population here to enjoy it so this game the bad news game i Mm -hmm. mentioned it's in english and russian maybe we could have folks translated into romanian but uh yeah i'm happy to to maybe we can post a link to it and, and get folks here playing it like hey this is open source yeah go 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 do whatever you want with it so is it going on right now in entire europe i know you lost in Slovakia, right? The campaign didn't work, which is fine. You lose a battle, you can still win the war. Um, is it something that's going on all across CE right now? Pre-bunking campaigns, they're not yet. Um, I think we, we we would like to. You know, Jigsaw doesn't have the capacity yeah. to do that ourselves, but we're putting the resources out there and talking with lots of people like you all here in Moldova mm-hmm. with the hopes that um, there will be some pre-bunking campaigns, especially before the EU election next summer. I, I just got an idea. What if the bad guys use a a pre pre bunking campaign? Totally. Did you ever have that before? We have. You um, did. You know, this is just a communication tool, and so anyone can use it, and you can use it for 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 good or for evil. Um, the problem is they don't really have any any evidence to to pre bunk. So I'll, I'll give you an example that. Uh, is really scary from from the U.S. and maybe it happens here too. But we have these white supremacists, these extremists, who would be going into um, Facebook groups or Discord servers of uh, incoming freshmen. So these are like 18-year-old kids going off to, to university, and they go into these these chat groups and they would say, "Hey, students, you're going to go to university and hear that diversity is a good thing. Actually, diversity is a bad thing." And they tell them that, you know, you're white and you're special and don't, mm-hmm. you know, don't listen to these claims about diversity. And all these blacks will come and take your stuff. Totally. Mm-hmm. They're, but they're starting to pre-bunk this idea of, uh, of diversity. And obviously, we need diversity. Pluralism is like part of how democracy functions. It's, it's core to our society. Um, 
but they they were trying to to get out ahead of this sort of like progressive idea that's very common in, in universities. Um, now it doesn't really work because they're not really able to explain uh, the manipulation of the pro diversity message because there's nothing manipulative happening. You know, diversity is a good thing, and I'm not manipulating you when I'm telling you that, or the professors are saying that at university. So, um, so they they certainly try to um, plant little seeds and they they try to sort of preempt messages, but uh, it's it's not quite pre-bunking and it, it doesn't quite work the same way. Just like I told my son the other day when he was crying about um, monsters under his bed, I said, you know, uh, like I ended it with, you know what's the, the crazy thing about monsters is if you say boo, they will run away because they have nothing against you. And I remembered, uh, which is why I love toy, um, uh, Pixar so much. I think they did Monsters, Inc., right? They did, yeah. It was such a good movie. It made you see monsters from the other side. So they, when I watched it, I was already kind of grown, but um, it it stopped scaring me. Like I'm still scared of the dark. I don't know why. It's I'm I'm 33 years old, and I'm scared to wake up at night to go drink some water because some vampire is gonna eat me. Obviously, I cover myself with a sheet, and the vampire is like, okay, sure, I'm not gonna touch you because you're covered by a sheet. But the same approach works here. If someone would actually ask them. But why is it bad? They'd be like, oh, well, you know, it's because it's not good. <laughs> exactly. That's usually how it ends, right? There's no, there's no yeah. good. I really didn't know where you were going to go there when we jumped from uh, white supremacy to your bedtime stories with your child. So I'm, that turned out really yeah. well, though. I like the I planned on it. metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'm really, really happy you came here and you shared with you... Um, uh, with me the the campaigns and the ideas that you have maybe uh for the end if you have a, a message or maybe you can talk a, about any other initiatives that i missed uh for the region if not um we can just um uh just say thank you for coming because i really enjoyed it i i wish i had a few uh just like sure a few thousand years to just Put this video out there as pre bunk because this could work like pre bunking, right? Totally. Like we could take excerpts and just post it on social media. I'm like, so you know, we have elections, and this is a professional talking about uh, what you might be subjected to. In every one of your podcasts, you can ask your uh, your next guest to pre-bunk something in their field of expertise, right? You know, they can pre-bunk something about the future of the fashion industry or the you know climate change denial or whatever is happening in tech. You know, you, you really could have everyone be pre-bunking for their own communities and their own area of expertise. That's what we were thinking about yesterday. Uh, when, uh, when I think, what was it, Amanda? When she was talking about uh, trusted flaggers, we were like, so why don't we have NGOs that are specialized in like agriculture and creative or, or tech? Because I don't know squat about agriculture. I wouldn't be able to tell if some information coming uh, to me is fake or not, or is meant to, you know, totally. say, okay, we're going to have a uh, severe drought next year when it's not true. But if these NGOs would become trusted flaggers, then it would be much cleaner uh, information space for us. Yeah. And I know Google is doing work with uh, trusted flaggers here in Moldova. We, we just signed up our first few in the last few months um, and they've already had a success uh, flagging sort of disinformation that they see um, in, in their sort of area of expertise, uh, whether it's in ads or in the content itself on places like YouTube. And so, yeah, I do think we need more of these experts with sort of like their niche areas that they're watching online because we can't watch all of the Internet uh, uh, ourselves. I mean, as much as You'd we try, need I know to hire you might, the Alex, entire but. planet <laughs> and still not have enough people. True, right? true. I'll, I'll give you one sort of parting thought here as I'm looking ahead. You know, the thing that's taking up a lot of my mental space, uh, keeping me up at night, it's not the monsters, but it's uh, it's generative AI. I forgot about it. Jeez. Yeah. Well, we yeah. had a chance to talk about Gen it this AI. morning already. There you, you go. Know? <laughs> so, so this morning I had a really good time. I got to hang out with, with you and, and a bunch of students. We actually had twice as many students as we thought were going to come here in, uh, in, in Chisinau. Um, they came to hear us talk about generative AI. And um, I posed a sort of framing of there being both promise and peril. And we've been talking a lot about all the cool new things we can do with image generation, video generation, even like changing our voices. They discovered so, Bard. Yeah, exactly. So someone's going to watch this podcast and they're going to press a button and change my voice into Romanian. 
so cool. I love that. Um, but but they, they didn't know about Bard this morning. And so we got to play with Bard a little bit and ask it to help us predict the future, both the, the promise and the, and the perils of what generative AI is going to do for us. What was your uh, perception of, of, of these students? Well, first, they, they were much more familiar with ChatGPT than Bard, but they came away pretty excited about what, what Bard can do and the way that it sort of both integrates the large language models and Google search, so it brings you more up-to-date results, and it can also fact-check or help That's you fact That's what I was going to ask you, because you had everyone ask a question about, you know, the society and to others, and then I saw the button that actually lit up even as the answer came. It's not like you have to press each button and see what it says, but it says, if you want to fact check this, press this button. So I pressed it and then it highlighted the text. So what are the different colors? Green is fact checked, right? Yeah, green is, it's, it's, um, it's a totally, uh, it's putting the fact checking back on you a little mm -hmm. bit and it's saying, if it's underscored with green, Google is saying there's a bunch of websites out there that we know support this information. Mm -hmm. You go check and make sure those websites are legit, but there's a bunch of them, and we're going to link you to it them. It might be true, something yes, like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's more likely. Think mm -hmm. of it as a probability. If it's green, it's a higher likelihood that it's legit. Mm -hmm. And if it underscores it with like a orange or brown, there's a big debate right now on whether it's orange or brown, uh, that means that Google can't really find a we lot of websites. Bart. Yeah. What do you think? It's just like that dress, remember? Yeah, Was it blue true. or white? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, what an internet throwback. I love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's really cool. The Bard is able to tell you, hey, I don't have a lot of certainty. I'm going to underscore this and, and, have, and link to the, the one or two websites that I do have that say this, but I'm going to admit to you, I'm not certain about this answer. And I think that's really important for us. You know, these models, they sound so confident in their responses, but it, they need to cue us. Like and conspiracy theorists. Totally. Conspiracy <laughs> theorists do this too. They, yeah. they say uh, total lies, but with a really confident voice. So these models, they've so far had a very confident voice. And now we're starting to build in ways for the model to signal to us, hey, I'm not so sure about this sentence. That other sentence, definitely true. This one, I'm not so sure. You should go fact check yeah, yourself. Yeah, because the more you interact with it, the more you believe it. And, and, and um, that's something we have to remember. It's not Bard, it's not ChatGPT or Claude or anyone else that's intentionally, hopefully not, but that's not intentionally trying to take you somewhere or lie to you or anything like that. It's just generating automated text. It's guessing what might come next. It doesn't uh, have a line of thought, right? It's right. not conscience. And it's trying to predict exactly what you want to hear. And so, you know, we had over 40, 50 students in the room this morning, maybe more, and they were each in theory typing in the same thing. They were asking Bard, you know, can you tell me how generative AI will impact society for good or for ill? But they might have used slightly different language because each of them was getting different results. And maybe some of them had past history with Bard and it was building on past and conversations. Remembers, yeah. Right, it can mm. it can build, and so you know I think what's cool is, it's it's just trying to predict what we want from it, and we have the power to really shape how it responds to us. That that the the prompt writing that we do, uh, completely influences. It's the like outcome. a super high level Google Assistant. It always tells you what you want to hear, right? Yeah. Because if it tells you something you don't want to hear, then you're like, hey, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go buy another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, what I uh, just. So since we're on the, this topic, I saw a video. There's this journalist that I really, really like, uh, Johnny Harris. I don't know if you heard about him. I have. Uh, crazy, the guy has a Pulitzer, but totally deserved. Um, where he had a video on deep fakes. Mm. And you're watching it and you're like, what? It's so good. And then he says, everything I said for the past five minutes, I didn't say it. Yeah. And you're just like, whoa, hit me with a rock. I don't believe this. I could not tell a single difference. And he was talking and his face was changing to someone else's in a completely natural, just like in the movies where you have, you know, hundreds of people work on, on, on making CGI look good. His, his head was changing, his voice was changing a little bit, and then his voice was the same. And then I don't know how he managed to edit it, but then when he actually started talking, there was no difference. It's a really crazy video. I've seen this video too. And right. Then, and then he goes into the face swapping and suddenly his face becomes Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. I mean, it's really, the technology is really, really wild. 
um, yeah. That's also the feature of media, kind of, right? Like, I want to watch a movie with Brad Pitt. Eh, no, I actually want to go Johnny Depp. <laughs> Just the actor's face changes. Hey, yeah. Google, change the actor's face. We have so many unanswered questions about, uh, you know, copyright and using people's likeness. You know, do the celebrities want you to do that with their faces? I, I don't know. That's what uh, they're protesting. For. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, the writers are yeah. protesting for sure. But, you know, I, I'm curious about how the actors feel about uh, people making deep fakes of them. On demand. Right. Right. right? Because they're like, hmm, let me make a selfie as if I'm this person. Yeah. It's scary. Yeah. I mean, I showed the students a, a deep fake this morning. Um, I, sh I gave them a lot of warning mm -hmm. that it wasn't real, but it was of President Biden. And he's uh, speaking in what looks like a perfectly clear English. And he's saying all sorts of funny things, um, complimenting Romanians. And he's going on and on about how amazing they are and how, you know, they can solve any problem and they're all rocket scientists. And uh, it's totally believable. And all of them weren't sure whether to laugh. You could see them like kind of uncomfortably like, mm -hmm. ha like this is funny, but like, whoa, this is scary because it looks so real. They did that in Slovakia, right? With the voice recording that people didn't believe is not real. Yeah, that's actually a scarier example, right? So in this one with Biden, he's just saying nice things. But in Slovakia, they uh, they actually made audio deep fakes of the president of, like, of the candidates that were uh, running in the election not too long ago. And uh, I think a lot of people unfortunately believed them because the audio sounded just like the real Because they the don't know what deep fake is. They don't, uh, it doesn't get to them. You know, if you live in a remote area where you don't really access internet other than, you know, maybe like five minutes a day, because there's a lot of people that do that. Yeah, a lot of people also are listening to radio, right? Especially in more rural areas. And mm -hmm. so if you just flip on the radio and you hear what sounds like a politician's voice, and it sounds very accurate, um, you might believe what they say. And so, you know, these... These opposition politicians were making deep fakes of each other, deep fake audio of each other, saying total nonsense. You know, some of it was funny. Like they blamed a guy for raising the price of beer. They said, if you elect him, he's going to double the price of beer, <laughs> which is hilarious that that's uh, how you swing a, a, an election in Slovakia. <laughs> but they also made, you know, more more dangerous accusations that, uh, you know, this guy is buying votes or this guy is going to, you know, help out. This Here's a recording group. of him talking to immigrants about exactly. invading. and It makes me remember that a first, I, th I think it's the first recorded event in history where um, disinformation made total chaos. Ooh, tell me about it. Uh, you know the book War of the Worlds? Yeah, I do. So I think it was 1929 or something like that. This guy was just reading the book on the radio and people who were connecting to it he was just reading, so they were out of context. They didn't know what's going on, and he was narrating very, uh, I think it's on YouTube, very like properly like an actor. So there was a giant panic everywhere. Freaking aliens are evading us. We're all going to die because radio was the most trusted. You know, he right. didn't have TV, and this guy's reading. And then apparently when he was like, I might be wrong, but when he finished it, it was like the whole place was on a giant mess. He's like, what happened? I was just reading a book. Yeah. I, I love that story. It is a it's a true story, and I think you're right that at that moment in time, radio was the source of truth. Right? That if someone said something on the radio, it had to be true. Yeah. We we then moved into an era where images were sort of the uh, credential of truth, and fact checking. Right? Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. You had these images coming out of like Vietnam and things, and that's how you knew what was happening there. And then we moved into a video age. And I think it was a lot of the footage from like uh, U.S. invasion in Iraq, for example, that, oh, suddenly, if it wasn't on video, we're not sure to believe it or not, especially as we started to get Photoshop and other tools to sort of edit images. They September became, 11 conspiracies. Right, right. We start to get conspiracy <laughs> yeah. theories that manipulate images, but but video was still too complex to, to manipulate there for a while. And so for, you know, the last few decades, video has really been our source of truth, our source of evidence. And so we're entering a, a scary new era now where, you know, President Biden, whoever, uh, Maya Sandu, can say things that uh, maybe they never said. We actually did uh, encounter that. Well, I think a few months ago, there's this group of Russian, I guess I could call them bloggers, whatever, just to say prankers, who call um high level officials in different countries mm. and use deepfake to present themselves as another high level official from another country 
I think Ukrainians got caught. Our president got caught. She was. She thought she was speaking to the prime minister of Ukraine. Wow. I think Olaf Scholz as well. Um, it, if they can detect it with all the security that you'd expect them to have and all the filters and whatnot, yeah. then I do not expect grandma to ever be able to detect it. Absolutely. And this it goes both ways. They actually now have deep fakes of grandma to you where they're saying, oh, Alex, I can't pay my rent this month. Can you wire me money? Yes. In the voice of grandma. I mean, that's really that's a really clever and, and awful These scam. These hackers, man. I don't like it. I know. All right. Uh, really glad we spoke. I think it was, think it was over an hour. Wow. Really, really, really good talk. I do hope you come back so we can talk more about um, uh, Moldova-related stuff. Uh, let's just say, you know, next year after the elections and whatnot. So we could see what worked and what didn't work to... to, to um, what is it uh, break down the the campaigns that we would do in the meantime i'm happy you guys are here i'm happy there's these baby steps and i hope that with all the tools that um, we have available now we will be able to protect ourselves you know at least a little bit like any i always say that one changed person is already a big win and when you're trying to fight the bad guys so thank you it was a real honor to be part of Google's first ever events in Moldova. Thank you for co-sponsoring it and for having us. Um, we will be back. And um, I'm really excited to see how Moldova steps up to fight disinformation, both around the election and every single day. Every little person matters. Uh, every every little false claim matters. So Every uh, phone. <laughs> I, every phone, every laptop. Uh, I'm rooting for you guys from uh, New York. So thank you. Thank you.